recording. Beautiful. There will be three separate recordings of this. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, as I've said, my name is Megan Hess. I'm the Rural Organizing Director at We the People. I'm joining this morning to share um, some background about the energy system with a caveat that I am not a policy person. And so I'm not going to get super deep into the weeds, although I think Horst is on this call. And so, Horst, maybe I might turn to you every now and then um, to share some wis wisdom and expertise. I want to talk about an action that's coming up um, this Friday, and it has to do with a task force um, in the state legislature and with state representatives. So the task force is called the Energy Reliability and Resilience and Accountability Task Force. Um, they weren't sharp on the name. I know. We're embarking on a listening tour called the Dependable Energy Listening Tour. So just to, to share a little bit of that background, residents um, from Houghton County, where you most of you are, um, but as well as Gogebic County and Marquette County are coming to the task force meeting. We're joining together. And at that meeting, we're going to be calling for a few things. Um, so just to give you some broad brushstrokes, uh, some notes as we dive in, folks there are going to be asking for affordable energy with protections from shutoffs. Folks are going to be asking for power outage compensation and better energy reliability. They're going to be asking for things like community solar and no cap on distributed energy. But the most important thing that folks there are going to be speaking to is getting utility influence out of democracy. So more on that in just a second, but for me, it's important um, to share a little bit about who I am and where I'm coming from. So I'm not just like the strange person jumping on your Zoom from Sault Ste. Marie on a Sunday morning in the summer. Um, so I, I'll offer just a little bit of background about myself. So you kind of, yeah, I don't, I don't wanna be a stranger to you. So these are two pictures, I'm in both. Um, in the picture on the left is me in a, it's a large wooden canoe called a Jimon. This is at a Line 5 protest um, a couple of summers ago. I got my start in organizing um, around Line 5 um, and Bridges Pipeline and trying to shut it down. And I was showing up a lot because I was really upset, right, that Enbridge um, was exercising power over the state government, is exercising power over tribal governments, um, that there was this sort of existential threat, right, to sovereignty, but also like the environmental threats. Um, that exist because there's this aging pipeline um, running through one of the most critical fresh waterways in the globe. And more than that, um, I was showing up for the people in this GMON. And those were relationships. These are folks that I almost didn't have any connection to that I wasn't almost ever able to build community with. And that's because of the photo on the right that I want to share a little bit about. This is a photo of me and my great grandma. Her name is Orline St. Ange, um, or married to become Orline Monroe. She grew up in a place called Detour, Michigan, so the very far eastern end of the Upper Peninsula. When she was five, the U.S. government took her from her family. Um, all of her ancestors were Native people to this place. She was in foster care until she aged out when she was 18. Um, and never talked about it. We actually don't know as a family what she experienced there, but we know that it had to be pretty violent and horrible um, because when she got married, she pretended to be a white lady um, and moved through the rest of her life that way. And as a family, we kind of understood this choice that she was making to be about survival. Um, you know, sort of masquerading as a white person was how you got access to housing and how you got jobs and how you kept your children, right, in that moment in United States history. So for two generations, my family didn't know um, that we were tribal citizens. My mom was applying for colleges in the late 60s, early 70s, and accidentally found out because of a letter she got from the state saying she qualified for free tuition under the Michigan Indian Tuition Waiver Act. Since then, um, she made a couple of really important choices for our family. She chose to put my brothers and I in our tribe's school. Um, and that for the first time in two generations was an open door back in relationship with people in the tribe. That school is where I met some folks in this GMON um, who are with me and who have been showing up with me in the Line 5 protests and in those actions. So when I think about showing up and organizing and when I think about power building 
And when I think about Enbridge, right, like, yes, I am like super upset um, at the way that they are operating with impunity and are, you know, offering harm and threats to the place that I live and the people that I care about. And I'm also showing up for people who are in this GMON with me to build the kinds of power it takes to keep other families from experiencing the kind of thing that my family experienced and to keep, to like to have enough power to like have agency in shaping the conditions that our communities live in. And um, I wanted to share a couple of, of memories that I have of the q and I've been with We the People of Michigan since 2017. I've been building the organization since then. My work has been power building, right? Building the kinds of people powers so that our communities have agency and can shape the future. Deep family roots in the Kiwana. Um, my dad's family lived there for a long time. My dad's in the upper left in that picture. His mom started an addiction recovery program for women um, in the church in Hancock in the 50s um, after recovering from alcoholism herself. And it's my dad and my mom and me um, after my graduation from tech in 2007. I love the legacy of this place. Um, there have been really important leaders from the American Indian movement um, in the 60s and 70s that have come out of the Keweenaw and the labor organizing um, during the mining and logging boom really like laid the foundation for the modern American labor movement to follow, right? So like the legacy I think is really beautiful. I've had the privilege of organizing here um, on my own at We the People. We led the coalition in 2020 um, that upheld their election results. And I think there might be some folks in this picture on the front page of the paper who are on this call. We the People, right, was at the center of that coalition. This community very literally upheld democracy. And I don't mean that in hyperbole. Had the State Board of Canvassers in Michigan not certified the vote in 2020, Arizona and Pennsylvania would have followed. And that would have ended the great American democratic experiment. So the like history and legacy of this place and the, the like importance of the work and the leaders have, it's been so beautiful, right? To, to participate in. Um, and I love that this is a, this is like a thing that we can continue, right? Like this is an active choice that folks are making on the daily. Yeah, that is, that is Barry speaking in that picture. I love it. Does anyone else remember, like have memories of, of that moment? Were you there? What was that like? Talk about it. That, uh, that was that was me uh, with the Microphone. speaker, um, <clears throat> and I was asked to make a few remarks because of being president of League of Women Voters. So it's on the courthouse step. I was on the courthouse steps. Uh, it was a, a small group there, but the main thing I remember is um, including in my remarks something about the. Um, peaceful transition of power, which we um, anticipated was coming, needed to be coming, and had no idea um, <laughs> how that would actually be playing out. Yeah. It was wild times as a country. And I'm, I remember, so after this protest, um, there was the State Board of Canvassers meeting where people from around the state called in to make public comment for seven hours and pressure the one Republican who was wavering um, to do his due diligence. And people from Houghton County called and people from Alger County called and people from Iron County called. And after the seven hours, right, they certified the vote. And that was it. Like it was up to one person and it was seven hours worth of people calling from around the state to ask him to do it. It was a really important moment. And specifically, I'm here to talk about the energy system. Um, as someone who lived under it when I was a college student in UPCO, right? And, and the kind of status quo that exists now, 
Elections also deeply matter for the energy system. Um, and I think about the system in three different ways. One is the generation part, how energy is actually made, produced, right? Coal plants, wind farms, what have you. Another is the infrastructure part, how through poles and wires and different built infrastructure, the energy gets from generation to people for use. And then there's the regulation part. And lawmakers at the state level are really shaping the laws and the policies that regulate um, utilities, investor-owned utilities in particular. And they decide on things like how quickly we move to green energy or not. And they decide on whether it's legal or not for communities to have microgrids or solar farms. The governor, who's also elected, right, appoints people to different governing bodies, like the Michigan Public Service Commission. And the ideas and politics and ideologies in that space really, really matter for shaping the energy system. So I think about that as the peopling part. <laughs> to make up a word, it's the peopling part that I want to talk with you about this morning. So a lot of you, I think at least some of you here are Upco customers. I want to share just to, uh, to get, kind of ground this conversation in something that's real and graspable to folks. Upco is what's called an investor-owned um, utility. It's a monopoly energy company. It was established way back in 1884 and has gone through various iterations for how it's shaped and how it's looked since then. It serves about 54,000 customers and it's changed hands a lot. Um, most recently, it was bought by a London-based investment firm in 2014, and then just a little bit ago by a Canadian firm, um, Axiom, in 2021. Does anyone know, um, and Horst, I'm not letting you answer this because you know, but does anyone know what an investor-owned utility is versus other kinds of utilities? Or want to hazard a guess? Well, it means the purpose of the organization is to pay, repay investors over making um, public uh, public good happen. Yeah, exactly. Their interest primarily, right, is making profit for other people. It ain't taking care of the community or the planet. Thanks, Bill, for that. So just for some discussion, right, and feel free to just pop off mute, what do you think that means in terms of making energy affordable? Like, how does that play out? Expensive. Energy has to be profitable rather than affordable. Yeah. What about reliability, like making sure the lights stay on and the heat stay on? What do you, how do you think it plays out for reliable energy? Just reliable enough. Reliable enough to keep people wanting to uh, use it as a source. Yeah, it's just enough for them to not get in trouble, right? expensive to keep the grid um, functioning well. What about sustainability? What do you think having an investor-owned utility means for sustainable energy? I think they're not interested in doing what's right for the environment necessarily, just making their dollars. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Exactly, right? Um, Investor-owned utilities will always have profit as a top priority. That means they're going to have as high rates as they possibly can and offering cheap service. It means there's very little incentive to maintain the grid or to implement new technologies that might be more costly. And without profit incentives, we're not going to be able to shift to the kinds of clean energy that we need or address climate change in the ways that we need to. I appreciate those thoughts. What if, what if we became a, a worker co-op uh, company? Up -co oh, dream yeah. of dreams. I want to um, so badly. I like at risk of going over time. I, I was an Upco customer right when I was a college student and I didn't know 
um, at the time that like when I was shedding real tears at my kitchen table in Hancock about my upco bill, um, that it was about them extracting profit from me as like a young adult trying to make it in the world. That it wasn't about me just being like irresponsible, right? Or yeah, not being a good enough adult. I would love, I would absolutely love for co like a cooperative structure or a publicly owned structure um, so that the utility is accountable to real people, right? And it wasn't about like squeezing a, you know, low income young adult for everything that they could. Um, there's some barriers to that that I want to get into in just in just a little bit, but I love that as an idea. So I also want to talk about some ideas relating to democracy. Um, investor owned utilities over the decades. So this is UPCO. This is also utilities like DTE and consumers in the lower uh, peninsula. They're able to really skillfully interfere with the democratic process in order to rig laws and regulations in their favor. So that means then that they've been able to act with impunity and customers historically haven't had the kinds of power or tools needed to like hold them accountable. So in order to have an energy future, right, to throw this idea at you, in order to have an energy future that allows our communities to thrive, we need a functioning democracy. And with utility influence, we don't really have that today. So I wanna just share some information about the ways in which utilities can influence democracy, right? And, and, and lawmaking and elections. One way is lobbying. Just to paint a picture, a couple of examples, DTE, um, which is an energy provider in lower Michigan, they spent almost $900,000 on lobbying um, between 2019 and 2021. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. Mind blowing, right? Um, the former owner of UPCO um, out of Wisconsin, they spent over $700,000 between a similar time frame in 2008 to 2010. Plus they didn't pay any taxes, right? That's a pretty magical thing that they got going on there. They're also able to make campaign donations. Um, and just in the last election, you know, statewide election in 2022, can, can all but six lawmakers at the state know. level took money from DTE and Consumers it's Energy, which are two of the investor-owned utilities. It's way worse than that. Um, we actually don't even know how much money gets spent through political action committees in elections because it's it's all it's like not reportable, right? Like that's the stuff that can be hidden. It's dark money. But we do know that at least one political action committee called Michigan Energy First gave over $5 million to a dozen groups, much of the money being spent to influence elected officials and public opinion on utilities. So it's pretty insidious. Um, and there's a lot, right? There's a lot that provides barriers to like the meaningful change that we're talking about to the energy system. So I guess I'm curious for folks here, does anyone have UPCO or even a different um, utility? And like, what has that experience been like for you or perhaps for your neighbors? This is Linda and we have, I live in Tapiola and we have uh, Ontonagon County Rural um, Electrification, which is um, more member owned and much smaller and um, the service in the beginning wasn't always as good as UPCO because they just didn't have the linemen to get out there and lots of rural areas with trees all over falling on lines. But they have really done a good job in the last couple of years of cleaning out under all the lines. Our service has not been interrupted very much and they we know who they are. They're approachable. They have yearly meetings that we can attend and air our grievances or give them compliments, whichever the case may be. Um, and so it's much more community oriented yeah, big contrast to up what a difference yeah when people in the community are part of the decision making that's great yeah. and we know the linemen and you know yes it is nice thank you for sharing that john Ballmer. thank you for your presentation uh i have a situation of being on both power companies i live in lake <laughs> linden and uh, I have UPCO here. Mm -hmm. uh, the bill for me has been okay, but uh, 
Uh, obviously, there is trouble with Upco. I have Antonagan REA at my cabin. The, mm. bill, the difference between the bills is enormous. Uh, and the service, well, Upco is okay, and uh, uh, the Antonagan REA is exactly as previously described. Mm. And they have cleaned out a lot of lines. They've been everywhere cleaning out lines. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, it's wild. It, not desirable, right? Is kind of what, the point, right? It is less than ideal. And the future is in set in stone, right? This isn't like the status quo isn't permanent. Laws and regulations that govern the energy system, they're just made by people out there making decisions and that's changeable. So, there's been a few of us, Miriam um, included, and it's been amazing to have her on board. We've been thinking about how that happens. Um, earlier this year, we formed a group called Wasamoan, which translates to lightning in Anishinaabe Moan. And we've been learning, this deep learning curve, how to change the peopling part, right? The like regulatory and peopling part, lawmaking of the energy system to change the status quo. So early this year, we we're like, cool, we got this idea. We're gonna meet with some lawmakers, our state representatives, Greg Markinen, where you all are, um, Jen Hill in the 109th next door, and see, right? Like, what are some some like kind of low hanging fruit uh, changes to the law that might be palatable, where we can practice um, and like build muscle for this kind of work? So we did that. Um, there was a set of us. Here's some of our smiling faces. This is sort of like there's Zoom on Zoom happening right now. Um, we uh, had conversations with Markinen. We had conversations with Jen Hill. And during this time, there were mass power outages in the lower part of the state. And we were like, it is time to change the law on outage compensation after outages. Utilities should be reimbursing people um, the real amount right, of, of harm. So like cost of medication, food, that kind of thing. So we pushed for it and had meetings. Generally, representatives seem supportive. And then um, we ran into a brick wall. Um, and the brick wall was named Speaker Tate, um, Joe Tate. Joe Tate takes lots of money from DTE and other investor-owned utilities. His job is to also keep the majority in the state house. And that means getting soliciting campaign donations. There's a lot of representatives, him included, we're actually not interested in making utilities unhappy. So right out the go, we couldn't even get a press conference right on outage compensation legislation, let alone a bill introduction, let alone any progress after that. Instead, a different lawmaker, um, Representative Helena Scott, who chairs the Energy Committee, which is the committee that hears all bills related to energy, was like, I'm gonna put together a task force though and we're gonna go on a listening tour. So this is like kind of okay. Um, our take is that the task force and listening tour are a distraction and that actual decisions about laws and policies regarding the energy system are being made somewhere else behind closed doors, probably with utility interests sitting at the table. But the task force also allows us a really important platform. It gives us a space where we can voice the needs of our communities face-to-face, -face, which is a rare opportunity with legislators, not just local ones, but legislators from around the state. Representatives are coming from lower Michigan. And it also allows us a public forum where we can talk about utility influence in government. So we're gathering folks from around the region to share personal stories, and experiences that can speak to affordable energy, that can speak to the need for reliability, that can speak to outage compensation, and where we can call for keeping utilities out of democracy. So different timeline um, than we originally anticipated, but the task force meeting is July 14th, which is this coming Friday from 11 to one. It's in Marquette. Um, on Northern's campus in the Northern Center. After that, we anticipating we anticipate meeting with individual lawmakers, so the ones in our region, but also ones from other regions, like Helena Scott, 
who holds really important decision-making authority about laws and policies for the energy system. Heading to Lansing for a lobby day to have more face-to-face -face time with these lawmakers and make the demands that we need in the hopes that by September, when the task force has done finished its listening tour, when they're ready to hear bills, but the bills included are the ones that we care about, right? The ones that speak to sustainability, affordability, reliability, and democracy. So we wanna get to them before they start bill introduction um, beginning in, in September. There's like a limited window of time that we can influence their decision-making. So I wanna offer a couple of ideas um, for what folks can do. Could choose to do nothing. Right, but it feels like we sort of agree that the status quo is less than desirable. And there's different levels of interaction that, that folks here can choose to engage in or not. So there's a, a opportunity to join us um, in Marquette on the 14th, and I can share some documentation about that. There's an opportunity to just provide written comment um, that we will share with these representatives. Um, and I can share a form for that as well. If you're a Facebook user, there's a Facebook event. And sometimes just joining the event to boost visibility is really helpful for other people in the community to see. And if you, I don't know how many folks use QR codes. Um, but if you have your cell phone, this QR code will take you to a document that outlines a bunch of what I've said here today um, and also has the, the links. So I'm actually going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to pause for questions while I share some of the links with you all. <clears throat> so open-ended, how does this, how do some of these ideas or, or thoughts, how are they landing with folks? And do you have questions about them? 